So once again, coming to you on a Saturday afternoon via the internet due to the ongoing, uh, well, like I call it, the inconvenience, this global pandemic. You know, like I said, you know, this isn't anything uncommon to man. Things like this have been going on forever. And when you think about what plagues mankind, whether it's illnesses or uh, even death caused by other people. Uh, what I think about is being back in Minsk and standing at the foot of these mass graves where people were killed by the hundreds and, and thousands and put to rest. And then I'm surrounded by this panic at the grocery store for toilet paper and chicken because of this illness that has what maybe a 1% death rate that that doesn't get me excited you know and I'll do what I need to do to help this thing pass by I'm not in any defiance or rebellion or anything like that but I'm not going to get worked up about it it's just one of those things it's the life that we live here on earth so we do what we need to do and because of modern technology, we have the ability to record a message and then people can have it at their homes on Sunday and continue on doing what we always do and we enjoy doing, that's reading and talking about the Word of God. So, today I thought it would be fitting to talk about something that I talked about a little bit a few years back. It was down in Lima at the Lima Rally. Uh, Marshall Harbor puts on, gave me a topic. I'm sure I didn't follow the guidelines of probably what he wanted me to talk about very well. But I ended up going back to an example we have in the Old Testament about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And it's one of my favorite examples. I'm not going to call it a story. It's true. It did happen. It's recorded in Scripture, so we can have confidence that it did happen. This was real people and a real event. Um, but the reason why I find myself thinking more and more about what happened to them, and also Daniel, and we'll talk about Daniel too, because he was right there, it's in the book of Daniel actually is where we're going to go, but he was right there and kind of endured some of the same things, and I'm going to point that out here in just a minute. But, you know, when I, when I understand that the things that were written were written for our learning, like we see in Romans 15 and 4, so then when I read things, especially from the Old Testament, and then I can think and apply it to life now and see some of those correlations and how they kind of go together, it can be uplifting and encouraging to know that God is not surprised by anything that may be going on. He's well equipped to handle anything, whether it's the, the evil world that we live in, full of bad people doing bad things, or if it's a fiery furnace, or if it's a den of lions. It doesn't matter. Nothing is too much that God can't handle. So if you want to go back to the book of Daniel, um, I've, I've kind of viewed this as... I mean, even almost to the point of a prophecy. Now, prophecy being uh, defined as a foretelling of something that's going to take place in the future. Now, I can't rightly turn you to, say, a New Testament writer inspired by the Holy Spirit that says, look to this example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it has direct correlation to times of now I can't I can't do that so I have to leave it in the realm of it's my opinion that this example borders on the lines of even more than just an example but almost even to a prophecy and here's why it's not because I just want it to because we got to look at everything that's laid out for us and then derive our opinions from that so in chapter 1 in the book of Daniel, gives a little backstory, uh, talking about uh, in verse one, the third year, of the reign of 
Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. All right, so drop on down to verse 4. He took some young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, because that's very important. That's, that's why I'm here. That's no doubt about that. <laughs> That's probably one of those bad jokes the wife said, isn't that funny? <laughs> uh, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Uh, the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies, of the wine which he drank, three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. So in verse 6, it says, Now from among those of the sons of Judah, okay, so these guys are Jewish, they're God's people, they're among the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. Now, we see a lot of times in scriptures people get their names changed, and that's what happened here. So he gave them names. So he gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar. Hananiah became Shadrach. To Mishael became Meshach. And to Azariah turned into Abednego. So that's where we get those three guys that if we didn't go back and take this, we wouldn't really know who they were, where they came from, or why they're even being mentioned. But now we know they were Jewish from the sons of Judah. They're right there with Daniel, being kind of set apart. Uh, you know, they're gifted in wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understanding. So now, verse 9 even says how God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill the chief of the eunuchs. So God's working with them. He's using them for his desired purposes. Uh, verse 17 Again, talking about these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had the understanding in all visions and dreams. Verse 19, the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, therefore, they served before the king. So that's who these guys are. So that's why I start to lean more towards these examples that we have of not only what Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had happened to them, but also what Daniel. He suffered a very similar uh, instance, which we'll look at too. So go ahead and go to chapter 3, and you see where Nebuchadnezzar made this image of gold in verse 1. You know, makes this decree. Everybody needs to bow down to it. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused. They were not going to do it. Uh, that's kind of verse around you know five and six, kind of laying it out. Verse six: Whoever does not fall down worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the fiery furnace. Um, Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the old image which you set up. So he calls them in, says, you better do this. They say, nope, we ain't doing it. So he has them cast into the fiery furnace. Let's pick up. Uh, well, verse 16, they answered and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, you're going to throw us in this fiery furnace, fine. If that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you set up. Then so Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed toward them. And he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Uh, I'm going to try to skip a little bit here because I don't 
want to spend too much time. You kind of get the idea. Uh, 22, therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed the men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I wanted to throw that in there just to get the, the full effect that this, this baby was hot. The guys that threw him in there died. So they do that. And in verse 24, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose haste and spoke, saying to the counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True. And he says, Well, look. He answers, Four men are loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So they do. Came from the midst of the fire, uh, sat traps, administrators, governors, the king, counselors, gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their gar garments affected, and the smell of fire wasn't even on them. So Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, and they frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except for their own god. So, again, it's a very interesting Example that we have of what happened to these guys. One of the things I like about it is they, their answer to the king that he may save us, God, he may save us, he may not. But know this, we ain't going to serve your golden image or your, your God. They were going to do what was right according to the Lord, the, the true God. didn't matter whether they lived or died. They, they were determined that they were going to do what was right and that's a good attitude to have it's very uh, beneficial when people have that kind of conviction and dedication because that's really what it takes to face the enemy that we face so again now you know I was throwing around these ideas of example prophecy I'll let the the hearer make that determination I gave you the 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 backstory and the evidence so I'm not going to push it either way but again it is pertinent to today because when I see that and then I look around at the world I live in it very much looks like a world on fire where everything is just burning down everything is being destroyed and whether it's again illnesses or just evil people doing evil things to each other you know death and sadness and heartache and and chaos is, is all around us in every nation and it's always been that way to an extent, and it's always going to be that way until the Lord comes back. We know that. The scriptures lay that out very plainly, that this is a sinking ship going down. So what I find encouraging about this is how they stood in the midst of all that with the Lord, with the Lord there with them, and the fire had no power. Fire is a destructive force, and it was rendered powerless to them. And it was because of the power of God that excels or exceeded the destructive power of the fire. So then, again, going back to this example or this you know, correlation between that and the world we live in today, well, I can see that very clearly then, that I can not have to run and hide or avoid this world that I have to live in because I have to live here. I can't live anywhere else. I have to be somewhere in the world as long as I'm in a physical body and I can't get away from the evil because it's everywhere. So then the only other alternative then is to do exactly what these guys did and make that determination, make that conviction and stand right in the middle of it with the Lord and trust and know that I can be unaffected by it. Now, that doesn't just come with a, a wish and a blink and a nod like the old genie thing, however that went. What was that? I dream a genie or something? You know, it, it don't work like that. You have to apply yourself. You have to learn. You have to 
want to understand, look through the scriptures, develop the relationship with the Lord, obviously get baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's number one. I should probably mention that because this is an internet thing. I don't know who's listening. So that obviously is the most important thing. You have to get in the game. That's the only way you get in the game. So you get all those things, and you have that, and then you're put into this predicament, and that can be the outcome. So that's why I wanted to go there and talk about that. Um, again, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time. I'll just give it to you. Uh, Daniel kind of suffered the same thing. He got thrown in the lion's den. And again, he was saved. Uh, yeah, it's, it's chapter 6, if you want to go back and read it some other time. Uh, verse 22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have, they have not hurt me. Okay, same thing. Lions, it's a destructive force, one of the fiercest predators in the world. And their mouths were shut and they didn't even put a scratch on them because the Lord saved them. Again, because he was not going to bow the knee or do what man wanted him to do. He was going to stay faithful to God. So, um, in John, John 6, I'm reminded of what Peter says to the Lord. He's talking about some things that was causing some controversy. A lot of people said they weren't going to walk with him anymore, didn't really know what he was talking about, and didn't really want to stick around to find out. So in John 6, uh, uh, well, he's talking about uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood in 53, Jesus is, which obviously we know is spiritual talk. It wasn't talking literally, but that's what turned a lot of people off to the whole thing, and they decided they were going to go away, and we're going to hang out with him anymore. So in 66, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And here's the verse. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You know, that very simple statement right there is very powerful when you take on the evidence of the world we live in and come to the conclusion that there is a creator there's a God and then you also come to the conclusion that humans mankind are eternal beings so that then this world is just simply well, it's, it's like a vapor is what James calls it that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. But this isn't all there is. So when you come to that conclusion that there's a God, people are eternal, then it makes the things of earth maybe not seem such a big deal or so important. Because it's just expanded your horizons of of your your mental capabilities so when he says where are we going to go really that's the underlying uh confession that he's making that this is huge and this goes way past anything of this life or anything of this earth and you have the words you have the words of eternal life speaking to jesus so where are we going to go it doesn't really matter at this point if we understand what you're talking about or if we like the way it sounds it doesn't matter because we know there's no place else for us to go well there's no place else in this world where we can find any kind of truth real truth and i this is something i may talk about another time when you really think about what truth is and i'm not talking about a dictionary definition but what I see of truth is authoritative communication. It's unchanging, it's unbreakable, and it's authoritative communication between the creator and the created. That, 
and I'm, that's something else I've just been tossing around my mind I'm working on. Maybe I'll talk about it some other time. But that's how I view it, and that's how I see it. So again, where else are you going to find something like that on this earth? Full of things that perish and rust and fall apart. Or volcanoes erupt and covered. I was watching uh, you know, a show about the lost city of Atlantis, how they kind of think maybe they built a thing right over top of a volcano and it got vaporized. Well, that wasn't very good planning, but you know what? Stuff like that happens. Mount St. Helens or Mount Vesuvius or anything. Natural disasters happen. People lose their lives. Everything you thought you had is suddenly gone. You know, we're on a three-week hiatus from, from work. You know, how many people are panicking because they don't have that steady income because now all of a sudden they're told they can't go to work? It, it doesn't take much, and people are panicking. And I don't want to be like that, and I don't like being like that. And, you know, a lot of times I don't think people like being like that, but they don't know what else to be because, again, they don't have the truth, so they don't have anything solid they can build on, so they take what's around them and just cling on to it tightly and hope that it's going to get them through. And then when it doesn't, they're in panic mode because where else are they going to go? Where else are they going to turn to? They've rejected the truth. They rejected God. So they have nothing else to cling to. And that's why they're you know, running over old ladies to get the last package of toilet paper. It, you know, it's sad. It's sad that people are like that because they don't have to be. And God made sure they didn't have to be because he gave us all of this so we can know and we can understand we can live better lives than that. So I got to move on. I'm still on page one here. So, okay. Yeah, here's the, the other takeaway. So when we're faced with uncomfortableness like we're experiencing in this country today, people just want it gone. They just, you know... I don't want to think about it. I don't want to deal with it. I just want this to be gone, away. Just get it over with. You know, I, I just want to get back to normal. That's, that's how people think. That's how they are. But you know what? Maybe we should rather stop and consider it. And, and when these uncomfortablenesses or painful things come upon us, maybe we do need to look into it deeply and pull out anything that we can pull out of it, whether it's personal or whether it's on a society side, you know, consider our lives and our focuses, our decisions, things on what matters, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, illnesses or loss or tragedy, God can use those uncomfortable times to help us grow, because that's really what Christians should be looking for, at least I think so, uh, the self-discovery, and also global understanding, again, as to why this whole earth even exists and what we're doing here and what our purpose is. Because here's the thing, if, if people's only objective is to avoid going to hell, then they're wasting their time. Because that's not the people that God is looking for. He's looking for and cultivating a people to live with in eternity, uh, bonded okay, pulled together, brought together by the same heart and desire for what is good and holy and to be rid of the evil that's in this world. That's what he's looking for and that's what he's doing. He's testing the hearts of man through all these different various things to see who loves the light and who loves the darkness, who loves truth and who loves the lies or the, the self-seeking. That's the term you see a lot used to describe basically evil intentions if you're self-seeking. James brings it out. It's also in other places in, uh, throughout the scriptures talk about that. It's selfishness. People that are selfish. If all you think about is just yourself, then the love of God isn't in you. So uh, a couple verses to kind of go along with, with some of that. Uh, well, Luke 13, Tower of Siloam here, 
uh, verse 2, Jesus answered, said to them, You suppose the Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things. That's about Pilate mingling their blood and the sacrifices. It says, They tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? No, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So again, Jesus ain't he's not really raising an eyebrow to these physical things that happen to people and how they meet that uh, transition from physical life to eternal uh, dwelling, uh, otherwise known as death. He's, he doesn't care too much about that, but he says, repent or you're going to perish. That's what you need to be concerned about. Don't worry about what happens here as far as those things go, but the state you're in when it happens. Also, uh, you know, First Peter two. Uh, again, talking about this more than just not wanting to go to hell. The people that God is looking for have a desire for truth, for righteousness, for the good things, holy, you know, upright things that are good, things that are noble, like Philippians brings out. So, First Peter two and nine. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not. There's a, cha chapter 2 and 4, if you wanted to go back a little farther, you can see kind of a little bit more into this, how uh, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, and precious you also as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You drop on down, verse 9, your chosen generation, a royal priest of the holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. It's a... It's a a special people. It's not, you know, in denomination world and some of these other faiths that claim the word Christian, they, they paint this picture of the gates of heaven being flung wide open and just everybody gets to come in with all their differences and, and their selfishnesses and wanting it their own way and wanting to you know, make God what they want God to be instead of looking and searching and wanting to know who he is. I mean, they got it all backwards and flipped around, but it sounds good, so so many people just go along with it, but it couldn't be farther from the truth. I'm not going to go into all that today, but the point that I just I want to bring out is that it's not about just avoiding a punishment like going to hell. It's not what this is about. It should be about personal discovery. It should be about understanding how society works in the world and why people are the way they are, why they do the things they do, but most importantly about the personal discovery because God wants us to overcome. Like I talked about, it. We, he's not giving all this power to empower a people to avoid everything. He wants us to face it, deal with it, and then move past it and move on with it. That's the only way you can really build the confidence and strength that we need to have and also that we should want to have. And, you know, the old saying, I don't know if... I'm sure I heard it from my mother and father... I don't know if you got it somewhere, just brought it or came up with it because of of my uh, constant challenges. But I was told many, many times that my direct opposition to whatever it is that I need to face is going to determine how many times I have to keep going through it. It's not just going to go away. Yeah, yeah. So the repetition of the challenge is going to be directly related to my... Uh, defiance to it. That's very true. So sometimes it's best to just bite the bullet and face whatever we got to face and move on with it. 
So, uh, I guess to kind of transition into the the last point here that I wanted to make, go to uh, Ephesians three. Again, just kind of talking about knowing the goodness of God here. So, Ephesians three. 3 and 18, well, 16, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Confidence, strength, knowing, sure-footed, founded on the rock. However, that's uh, well, uh, chapter 2, the end of chapter 2. He talks about we being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets of Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone whom the whole building being fit together grows into a holy temple and the Lord kind of goes right along with what Peter was saying when we looked at that. It all ties together. It all fits together. It's, it's confidence. It's strength. It's hope. It's everything that a person needs and wants in this life. And it's all right here. So, getting to my conclusion here. Okay, the world is it's evil. And it's all around us, just like the, the fiery furnace or the lion's den. The only escape is to be above it by the knowledge, just like was brought out in Ephesians. The only way we're going to rise above it is having this strength in the inner man through his spirit, rooted and grounded, able to comprehend, filled with all the fullness of God. That's the only way we can rise above our situation, whatever we find ourselves in. It, it is to be above by knowledge, and it's because of something greater than the struggle, which is God and eternity. What, what's above God? Nothing. So obviously, if we are in step with the Lord and strengthened with His Spirit in the inner man, then what is going to overpower us? What's going to overtake us? John 14 and 30, Jesus talks about how Satan is coming for him. But he says, but he has nothing in me. That's exactly what that means, to be in the midst of the fiery furnace or in the lion's den and be untouched, for those destructive natures to be powerless over that person is exactly that right there. They have nothing in me. I, my mind is so far past whatever this situation is that it has no power over me. Physical example, spiritual reality. That's, that's how we kind of build our faith when we read these scriptures. So also, God has an empowering people to be really good at avoiding. We talked about that. Or, or hiding, so we shouldn't allow emotions to overtake us when misfortune happens. But look deep into it on the personal level and even uh, society to gain understanding as to what's going on, see it clearly, maybe help those that uh, need some help to get through. Colossians 3 and 10, we put on this new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. That's how it's done. It, it's not just by, you know, like I said, with some of the denominational world, uh, just making up fairy tales about, uh, you know, a God in heaven that we basically make up in our own mind and think that that's somehow going to be okay and it's going to work. No, it doesn't. It's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The only way you're going to be set free in this world and in this life is through knowledge. Knowledge of the authoritative communication, also known as truth, as I've just kind of coined it, I guess, in my own meditation and uh, consideration times. 
That's the only way. That's the only way. You're going to be set free. Jesus even says, you know the truth. Truth will set you free. So, uh, James 4 and 14, he talks about our life as a vapor here on this earth. It's, it's short-lived. Eternity is forever. So, again, where, where should our focus be? What really matters? Uh, again, and then, you know, people need a right now. I'm struggling now. I'm uncomfortable now. I need something now. You just want to talk about this eternity stuff all the time. That doesn't do me any good right now. Well, we kind of hit on it already back in Ephesians, but go to Philippians 4 and 7. The Bible talks about this little thing called the peace that passes understanding. So in verse 7 of Philippians 4, it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Okay. When you see everybody running for the grocery stores, even though there's not a food shortage, or any of the other things that people do that you think is a little bit strange, you wonder, why, why are they doing that? What, what? Well, they're panicking. Well, should the people of God be panicking? I don't think so. We don't have any reason to panic. When we have all this knowledge, and we have this strength, and we have this truth, and we have all these things, then we have what is called the peace that passes understanding. In other words, I understand that I can't go to work for a few weeks. I understand there's a global pandemic. I understand that if that doesn't kill me, something else will. I understand that my house could burn down. I understand that all the things I have on this earth can be taken away from me in a moment's time. But in spite of all that, I still am at peace with it. I'm okay with it. And that is what people need, especially today. They need some peace. Well, that's what God gives through the knowledge of his scriptures, the strength of his spirit, through his son, through the waters of baptism, and it gives the people peace. Could you just take the pain away? Maybe make you rich and famous? Wouldn't that be better? I mean, that's right now. Give me that right now. Well, you know, it's a funny thing about pain. It's, uh, it, it develops a, a healthy... Uh, I don't want to say a reward system, but it, it helps develop people's, uh, oh, well, I'm not going to pull it up now. There's a good, uh, a good study that Mark Miller has been doing about that pain and how uh, people that are born with this congenital anesthesia or some big fancy medical word, basically it means that they don't have the ability to feel pain. That's a real medical condition that some people are born with. And it sounds great. Oh, yeah, man, I wish I had that. Well, when you actually look at what it is and how it affects people, it's actually worse. It's not a good thing because they don't have that healthy, uh, like I said, reward system of not doing things that's going to hurt them because they don't have that, that pain to... Stop them from doing it. In other words, you get something in your eye, you, oh man, you know, this is driving me nuts. So you get water, you go to the doctor, you do whatever you do to get it out. Well, if you can't feel it, then it goes untreated. Next thing you know, they got to take your whole eyeball out because the thing's ruined. You can't see now because there's something there and you didn't know it. Same thing with anything else. You jump off the roof, you break your leg, you don't know it because you don't feel any pain. You keep walking around on it, it ruins you know, everything else in your leg when they got to cut the thing off or something because you didn't have that pain as a, a, a stopper from doing those things. So it's the same way. God uses these things to, to teach us. Well, it could be, you know, emotional pain, uh, you, know, uh, you know, on the inside kind of stuff. You do something you know is wrong, you feel bad about it, God using that, say, hey, don't do that no more. See, that's bad. So we associate pain with it. So don't do that. Again, if, if we didn't have the pain, we wouldn't know where the problem is. So we need these uncomfortablenesses 
in these panes so we can see where the problems are. Maybe there's something in my life that I wasn't aware of that now has been brought out to light to where I you know, say I'm having a hard time with what's going on right now. Well then, now, because of that, I can look back in myself and my life and my own thinking and think, man, is there something that I'm not dealing with? Am I putting too much trust in my, my physical things? Is that what's going on here? It's things like that. that it, it's good. It's a good thing. We need to not run away from things and not want to deal with them or push them aside. Go ahead and look into that. And through that self-discovery, we can find healing and peace and happiness and move on from it. So in the midst of whatever we face, we can have that peace. These examples, like with uh, Daniel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all those years earlier, what they were able to, to do, and then for that to be recorded so now we can look at it today and see the delivering power of God and the, the strength and determination that they had to do the right thing no matter what it was going to cost them. You know, all these things we put into our minds, we think on it, we meditate on it, and in so doing, we overcome the world that we live in, the evil that surrounds us all the time that we can't get away from. Run as you may, you can't outrun it because it's everywhere. So we stand and we face it, and the power of God renders the, those destructive powers, the evil, completely helpless, renders it useless against us. So, just want to share those thoughts this afternoon. Thanks for your attention, and we will see you next time.